it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Vatican is studying vampires at a secret research facility. 3rd of October 2019, Vatican City. On the vanishingly slim chance that a living human being happens upon this writing, I am obliged to forgive her in advance for thinking its author mad. As shall become clear presently, the story to which it bears witness is one that no sane person could accept. Indeed, the author himself wouldn't have given it the slightest credence had he not found himself quite unexpectedly at its center. My name is Father Simon Merchant. I am an ordained priest in the Society of Jesus, better known as the Jesuit Order, as well as a trained microbiologist and with subspecializations in virology and bacteriology. I became a Jesuit after completing my undergraduate studies at Harvard and earning a medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. I subsequently completed a doctorate in microbiology from Oxford and, until recently, was professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology at the Georgetown University School of Medicine, where I also served as chief research scientist in the McClellan Institute for Virology. I do not mention these credentials to boast, but rather for the sake of lending some degree of credibility, however small to what I am about to write. Besides, I will never serve in any of these capacities again. I will not survive the night. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Please forgive me, the prospect of impending doom compels me to rush. In late July, I was suddenly and unexpectedly summoned by my provincial superior, Father Joseph Quinlan, to an impromptu meeting at the headquarters of the Jesuit Conference in Washington, D.C. Forgoing any pleasantries, Father Quinlan immediately produced a signed directive from none other than the Superior General of the Order himself, stating in no uncertain terms, but without explanation, that I was expected in Rome in a week's time. Everything has been arranged, Father Quinlan said flatly. Georgetown has approved. Yeah, but with all due respect, Father... What is this all about? I asked, making no attempt to hide my confusion. I know nothing more than what is in this letter, Father Merchant, he replied. Pack your bags. A week later I arrived in Rome, where I was welcomed at the airport by a young, nervous-looking Jesuit in a stiff black cassock. Father Merchant, he said, I am Father Antolini. I am to escort you to the Vatican. Like Father Quinlan before him, the anxious young Jesuit had little to offer by way of explanation. Thinking better than to press him on the matter, I allowed him to carry my bags to the waiting car and obligingly took my place next to him in the front seat. Following a relatively short, if awkwardly silent drive, we passed through the gates of Vatican City and proceeded to an imposing building that I immediately recognized as the Museo Chiara Monti. Father Antolini parked the car in a sort of alleyway behind the museo and, after unloading my luggage from the trunk, ushered me through a conspicuously out-of-place door. There we were met by an elderly man wearing the black and white robes of a Dominican friar. Father Merchant, he said with a kind smile, I am Dom Collini. Welcome back to Rome. Thank you, Father, I said, shaking his hand. May I ask, um, what... He cut me off with a raised hand. All will be explained. Father Antolini here will see to your backs. Now, please, follow me. We entered a large elevator which, by the looks of it, only had two buttons. One for up, the other for down. Dom Collini pressed the latter with a gnarled finger and grinned toothily. I uh, know what you are thinking, he mused as we began our descent. Prepare yourself accordingly, Father. Everything you think you know is about to be unsettled. The elevator door opened to a cavernous underground vestibule where a sign on the damp stone wall read Institutum Pontificum Studiorum Occulti The Pontifical Institutes of Occult Studies A deep voice roused me from my silent, awful gawking. Father Merchant said a man in front of me. I am Father O'Hara. 
Though I couldn't place his deeply grooved face and dark eyes, I immediately recognized the name. Gerard O'Hara, the microbiologist? I asked in an incredulous tone. Yes, he replied flatly. It is a pleasure to finally meet the acquaintance of so esteemed a colleague. I am a great admirer of your work. Oh, the pleasure is all mine, father, I sputtered, shaking his hand. It's not every day that I find myself in the company of a Nobel laureate. Oh, please forgive me. What exactly is going on? No one has offered the slightest explanation since I received the superior's letter in Washington. I'm sure you are incredibly confused, Father O'Hara said with a patient smile. My apologies. For reasons that will become clear, we have been obliged to keep the nature and purpose of this meeting a secret. This very facility and the work that is undertaken here is itself highly classified. You will understand presently. But what on earth is this place? I inquired plaintively. I know you are a man of science, he said. So am I, but we are also men of God. Should it really be surprising to either of us that the Vatican has a secret research facility that studies all things supernatural? Oh my, jaw dropped. Supernatural? He nodded. Not the supernatural that is of God, mind you, but the uh, other sort. Demons, ghosts, witches, and many other things besides. The Institute has been studying these phenomena for centuries. Its work predates the dawn of modern science, though only a small handful were, are, or ever will be aware of its existence. Well, I laughed despite myself. <laughs> You've got to be joking, I said. On the contrary, he replied, gesturing to Father Collini, whose presence I had momentarily forgotten. Our Dominican colleague here is the world's foremost authority on demonic possession and exorcism. Did you know that? Dom Collini smiled courteously and made a slight bow. Well, of course you didn't, Father O'Hara continued. No more than you knew that I have been conducting research on vampires for nearly fifteen years. As far as anyone knows, Dom Collini is nothing more than a medievalist, and I am uh, merely a biologist however accomplished each of us may be in his respective field. Father, I said, shaking my hand and screwing my eyes shut. What you're saying right now is absolutely insane. Can you please tell me why I'm here? He shrugged. Come and see, he replied, indicating a door to his right. We proceeded into a massive library with hundreds of shelves, all of them lined from floor to ceiling with dusty volumes. Father O'Hara pressed a button on the wall and a large window emerged through which I saw what appeared to be a prison cell. Huddled motionless on the floor of the cell was a young man, or what seemed to be a young man at any rate. He was naked, rail thin and as white as a sheet. His face turned away from the window. We call him Tomislav, Father O'Hara said. Our operatives captured him in rural Serbia. Evidently, he murdered his entire family along with six others. Who is he? I replied in a near whisper. That is not a he, Father O'Hara remarked. That is an it. I turned to look at him. What do you mean? I asked. Dom Collini chuckled from behind me, surprising me once again with his presence. Tomislav is no longer a human being, Father Merchant, he said. Tomislav is a vampire. I wheeled around to find myself eye to eye with Kalini. Oh, enough of this, I shouted with a wizened face. Who is that man and why is he in that cell? Uh, would you please be so kind as to redirect your attention to the window? Asked Father O'Hara. I did as he requested it, at which point he pressed another button on the wall. The figure in the cell immediately sprang to life from the floor and catapulted itself headlong against the window. Seeing its face, I instinctively recoiled. The pupils of his cat-like eyes were narrow black slits ringed by sulphur. 
his mouth a gaping red gash filled with yellowing, razor-sharp fangs. He continued to smash his body against the window, all the while gnashing his hideous teeth and bellowing in a beast-like roar. Don't worry, said Father O'Hara. He can't see you. I stumbled a few steps backward and crossed myself. What the... As Dom Collini said, O'Hara interrupted, that is a vampire. I gawked at him with wild eyes. Impossible, I sputtered. There, there are no such things. It's, it's a superstition. And yet, uh, here is one before your very eyes, replied Dom Collini. Father O'Hara closed the window and ushered me to a chair. I collapsed onto it, cradling my head in my hands. Father Merchant, he said somberly, I know this comes as an enormous shock to you, but I assure you that you are not losing your mind. The thing behind that window is very real and very dangerous. The church has been stalking its kind for millennia. Only recently has it begun to capture and study them. It wasn't that long ago that I found myself in precisely the same situation as you. I too was summoned here for reasons unbeknownst to me, and I too was shaken to my very core when I first beheld these creatures. But why me? I asked through my hands. For the same reason I myself was, O'Hara replied, for your expertise. My predecessor was the first to discover that the underlying cause of this phenomenon is, at least in part, microbiological. I was brought here to take his research to the next level, and you are here to do the same with mine. I looked up, my eyes red and irritated. What? Taking a breath, he sat down next to me and folded his hands in his lap. We have known for some time about the existence, the actual existence, of incorporeal entities. Spirits, demons, ghosts, angels, and so forth. But as Dom Collini will be the first to admit, our ability to comprehend such entities, let alone manage them, is rather limited. Ever since the Church reconciled itself to science, which it did in no small part thanks to the efforts of our Jesuit forebears, it has not shied away from using the scientific method to expand the scope of its understanding. Unfortunately, that method is useless when applied to things without physical existence. The same is not true for our friend Tomislav, which, whatever else he or it may be, it is an embodied, material entity. Well, albeit of a sort we never encounter in nature, interjected Don Collini. Oh, I'm getting to that, O'Hara replied sharply. First things first. Father Merchant, what I and my team have discovered may be summarized thusly. The root cause of vampirism is a virus, or something very much like a virus, that we have named the N1 photophobic hemophage. As far as viruses go, it's a large one. The virions are 90 or so nanometers in diameter, but it's definitely not a bacterium. It does not have any independent genetic capacity for metabolism or reproduction. It's nothing more than a bundle of nucleic acids, but, to that extent at least, it is molecularly carbon-based. What makes the N1PH so uh, mysterious is the manner in which it operates. Upon being introduced to the living bloodstream, it immediately attaches itself to a host cell, sheds its protein coat, and injects its genetic information just like a virus. From there, it reproduces itself trillions of times, albeit at a rate several orders of magnitude higher than any natural occurring pathogen known to us, and proceeds to do what all viruses do when it gains the upper hand. It kills its host. So, you're telling me that thing in there is dead? Father O'Hara sighed and averted his gaze toward the towering bookshelves. Well, he replied, not exactly. Think of the movies and comic books, Father Merchant. What do they tell us about vampires? I smirked. They hate garlic and holy water and sunlight, I said. That they cast no reflection, that you kill them by driving stakes through their hearts. 
I was driving at the notion that they are neither living nor dead, but undead, said Father O'Hara, returning his gaze to me. How can something that is dead move about seemingly of its own volition? How can it intelligibly communicate in human language if it does not think? And how can it think if it does not have some sort of rudimentary consciousness? On the other hand, how can it be alive if it doesn't have a heartbeat? If it doesn't oxygenate its blood through respiration? If it lacks homeostasis or metabolism? The thing you saw flailing about in that cell has a body temperature of well below 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It is capable of moving air through its lungs, through its larynx, but it does not breathe. It has reflexes, it responds differentially to stimuli, it even feels pain, but it does not eat. Yeah, it drinks blood, interjected Dom Collini. What you're describing is biologically impossible. I stated decisively. In the absence of oxygen and nutrition, living cells die. This is indisputable. And this is what is truly miraculous about N1PH, replied Father O'Hara. In less than 48 hours, it completely overtakes every single living cell in a human body, replaces them with hybridized iterations of itself, and systematically reprograms the genome. The virus alters the cells at a molecular level so they are able to reproduce indefinitely without oxygen, without digestion, without excretion. This effectively renders them immortal. It also invests them with a mind-blowingly heightened capacity for regeneration, and that effectively renders them invincible. It strengthens the bones, increases muscle mass. The list goes on and on. The end result is an organism that is virtually indestructible, with levels of speed, agility, and strength that are far in excess of anything human beings are capable of. But there are a few catches. Oh, it drinks blood, Dom Collini reiterated, much to Father O'Hara's annoyance. Yes, it drinks blood, O'Hara snapped. Hence the term hemophage. The vampire is compelled to consume blood by a genetic imperative that we do not fully understand. Blood is the raw material out of which the virus replenishes itself, or rather the hybridized, formerly human cells it has subordinated. The fangs you beheld in the creature's mouth are the result of the virus recoding its genome to meet this imperative. So is its stomach, which no longer digests so much as it uh, absorbs redirecting the blood food directly to cell nuclei through a network of microscopic rhizomes. So, what happens if it goes without blood? I inquired. Father O'Hara grinned. Oh, we have studied that at great length, he said. The vampire must consume around 5% of its body weight in blood every 48 hours or so. If it does not do this, it begins to putrefy rapidly. On average, it cannot endure without blood for more than three days. Beyond that point, the N1PH seems to, well, shut itself off. When that happens, all of the hybridized cells that comprise the vampire's body begin to die simultaneously, resulting in freakishly accelerated decomposition. But there's another catch. N1PH is extremely photophobic. So much so that a typical virion will completely disintegrate after five seconds of direct exposure to sunlight. We suspect that this trait is directly or indirectly linked to the vampire's predation habits. It hunts most effectively at night. But more than this, consumption of blood appears to induce a kind of diurnal hibernation during which the aforementioned absorption takes place. It's also during this time that any and all damaged cells are regenerated. This defies rudimentary logic, Father O'Hara, I said, shaking my head. L let me ask you this for a start. Can vampires be killed or not? Yes, in the sense that certain forms of physical trauma, exposure to sunlight, decapitation, destruction of the heart, and such like, cause the virus to shut off in the manner described previously. Okay, but why? I asked. Father O'Hara shrugged. To be perfectly frank, this is not something we understand. Why, for example, should the destruction of the heart, which is, for all intents and purposes, a vestigial organ for a vampire, why should it cause it to perish? Even more confoundingly, 
Why must the heart be destroyed by wood, and not just any wood, mind you, but only the wood of specific trees? We do not have any answers to these questions. I nodded. All right, I said. Well, here's something else. Shouldn't be vampires be far more numerous, and thus far more noticeable, given their degree of uh, super-evolution? We do not entirely understand this either, replied O'Hara. In the vast majority of cases, it seems, vampires simply kill their human prey rather than communicating the virus so as to create new vampires. It turns out infection is prevented by an enzyme that's secreted through the fangs. So the virus doesn't exhibit a reproductive imperative. It's unclear, said O'Hara. When vampires do create new vampires, the enzyme I mentioned is withheld. We cannot ascertain whether this occurs naturally, for example as part of a genetically programmed reproductive cycle, or whether it is something that the vampire itself wills. This is at least the second time now you have alluded to volition, I remarked, scratching my head. Honestly, the thing in the cell didn't seem to have much control over itself. That's because it was agitated, O'Hara replied. As you'll see, Tomislav is more than capable of acting like a human. Dom Kalini and I have both conversed with him many times. Uh, if I may, uh, Father O'Hara, Kalini interjected, perhaps now would be a good time for me to step in. O'Hara heaved a sigh. Go on, he said. As my colleague has already explained, Kalini continued, the virus doesn't destroy the host cells so much as partially it transforms them, and as a result they remain in a kind of uh, suspended animation, as it were. This is just as true of brain cells as it is, it is of, well, any other type of cell. Thus the vampire necessarily retains a capacity for language, cognition, thinking, and memory. Vampires were once living people, a neurochemical trace of which remains imprinted on the brain. What they completely lack, though, it seems, is the slightest capacity for emotion or moral conscience. Worse, they seem to derive some kind of sadistic stimulation or pleasure from killing, and it is precisely the desire for this pleasure, not just a hunger for food, that drives them to do so. Uh, one might say they like to play with their food, to toy with their prey. They delight in the hunt. They delight in instilling fear and causing pain. In a word, they are pure evil, O'Hara remarked. Kalini nodded. Uh, precisely, he said. And this is where my colleague's scientific acumen begins to falter. Many of the superstitions surrounding vampires are false. <laughs> do vampires cast a reflection? Of course they do. They are physical entities, but many of these superstitions are true. Most interestingly, the fact that vampires experience extreme distress at the mere sight of a cross or other blessed object. Holy water has the same physical properties as an unblessed water, but yes, it causes physical damage to a vampire's flesh. How can this be? You tell me, I replied dryly. My area of expertise is demons, Father Merchant, Galini said. Unlike vampires, which have weight, height, proportion, and the like, demons cannot be poked and prodded in a laboratory. But vampires are very much like demons in one crucial aspect. They are motivated by an unrelenting appetite for evil. I do not doubt that there is a biological dimension to that appetite, but it is not ultimately reducible to their physical constitution. Father O'Hara huffed slightly. Vampires cannot be monsters of the sort we routinely find in the animal kingdom, Galini continued, nor can the virus that brings them into existence be the mere result of an evolutionary mutation. Ah, someone or something had to create that virus and I am enough of a philosopher to know that it wasn't God. Then who was it? Father O'Hara spat in an irritated tone. The devil? Look, brothers, if I may, I said calmly. The one question that's not been addressed is, why am I here? I cannot dismiss anything that's been said without dismissing your obvious intelligence and sincerity. Though I... Do not pretend to understand any of it, not a single iota. I am at least prepared to admit that the phenomenon to which you have introduced me is, in some sense, very real. But again, what could any of this possibly have to do with me? Father O'Hara's countenance darkened. Where there is a virus, there is a vaccine, 
he pronounced gravely. I eyed him suspiciously. You want me to find a cure for this? Not exactly, O'Hara replied. Father Michelski, our chief pathologist, has developed a trial vaccine. The Holy Father himself has directed you to review Michelski's work and evaluate the merits of testing it. Sebastian Michelski is in on this too? I thought to myself in exasperated wonder. But is there anyone from Pontifical Academy of Sciences who isn't involved in this project? O'Hara produced a small envelope from his cassock and handed it to me. The papal seal was clearly visible on its face. Based on what you've told me, I said, opening the envelope, traditional vaccination models would scarcely seem feasible in a case such as this. As the document in your hand makes clear, said Don Collini, my role here is that of Advocatus Diabolus, and apologies for the bad pun, I am obliged in that capacity to warn you that the ultimate cause of this phenomenon may be diabolical. What do you mean? I asked. I have personally witnessed dozens of demonic possessions, he replied. If it is possible for a demon to take control of a living and soul body, what is to stop it from doing the same thing to a corpse? And what if the virus is merely the physical mechanism by which this end is achieved? In that case, destroying the undead body does not vanquish the source of its reanimation. It merely frees it to do the same to another. Well, this is where Dom Collini and I part ways, O'Hara remarked. The undead are not insoled. They're killing machines that mimic the speech and behavior of living men. I make no objection to the prospect that Satan himself is the ultimate cause of vampirism, but I deny that vampires are merely possessed cadavers. Father Collini said it best. The hybridized cells are in suspended animation. They are neither living nor dead. If there was a way to eradicate the virus while simultaneously reviving the original cells, would this not be akin to reviving a patient in cardiac arrest? Father Collini turned to Father O'Hara. Such a patient is only momentarily dead, or rather not alive, Collini said brusquely. You yourself have studied vampires whose bodies are hundreds of years old. Have not the souls that once inhabited those bodies long since gone to God? Who are you to wrest those souls from him? That is for the church to decide, not us, replied Father O'Hara with equal venom. But Father O'Hara, I interjected, surely the question is moot if the course you propose is impracticable. I mean, as you said, the only way to cure this virus would be to engineer antibodies that are capable of killing it while simultaneously recoding the genome of the original cells. <laughs> How can such a thing be accomplished? Is that not akin to what we do with pluripotent cells in gene therapy, Father? He replied. In any case, this is precisely why you are here, to make this sort of determination. My colleagues and I have paved the way for you. I exhaled deeply and stared at the floor. Ah, so, does our friend Tomislav speak English? At my request, Father O'Hara brought up the window to Tomislav's cell and, with the push of a button, enabled the creatures to see the three of us standing beyond it. As before, the vampire was huddled on the floor in a pallid heap. Thomas Lav, I said through the intercom. I'm Father Merchant. He stirred slightly before angling his head slowly toward the window. The monstrous features I'd observed previously were gone, replaced by the visage of an ordinary man in his early twenties. My name is not Thomas Lav, the creature replied in a thick Balkan accent. I... I'm Radovan Grubacic. Not anymore, said Father O'Hara to my left. I held up a hand to silence him. My apologies, Radovan, I said calmly. Do you know why you're here? The vampire leered at me and snickered menacingly. His eyes sparkled with malevolent intelligence. Do you know why you are here, priest? My understanding is that you have a disease, I replied. I'm here to determine how to help you. The snicker grew to an uproarious guffaw. <laughs> Help me. Is that what you call this torture? You know it's for your own protection, I said. My understanding is that you've murdered many people. The laughter subsided. It is I who must be protected from your companions, the vampire said, pointing a long, thin finger at Fathers O'Hara and Kalini. 
I noticed for the first time that his fingernails were razor-sharp talons. They have subjected me to unspeakable torments. Radovan, are you a vampire? I inquired plainly. I am an immortal, the creature shouted, springing limberly to its feet. I am the incarnation of the very thing you charlatans promise the ignorant masses only in death. Now you call it a disease and presume to cure me of it. Would you do the same for your Christ, I wonder? Father Collini produced a small crucifix from his robes and held it up toward the window. Stay where you are, he growled. The vampire recoiled with a sinister hiss. Why did you tell Father Merchant here what you did to your own children? said Father O'Hara. The vampire resumed his snicker. Ah, the price of immortality is blood, it said to O'Hara. Is this not what your church teaches, you hypocrite? We're here in our capacity as scientists, I interjected. Our aim is to understand. Fine, then, the vampire replied, turning his dark, cold eyes to me. You understand survival of the fittest. This is the creed of your mortal science. Does the wolf murder the sheep, or does he merely do what is in the nature of all creatures to do? That is, survive. It's not in the nature of human beings to kill other innocent human beings, I retorted. The history of your race suggests otherwise. The difference is that unevolved human beings like you feel guilt and shame at what clearly comes quite naturally to you. I, we, have transcended your weak, pitiful kind. Our destiny is to inherit the earth. Yours is extinction. Come, scientist. Surely you understand that there's no morality in nature... Only strength and power. Oh, perhaps it's wrong to say that the wolf murders the sheep, I replied. But does he enjoy stalking her? Does he take pleasure in her agony? Because, as I understand it, your kind is motivated by something more than a will to survive. You delight in killing. The vampire leered. Power is freedom. What human being does not seek freedom and find delight in the power that comes from it? I have been free from the shackles of your pathetic morality. My power lies in this. I am more human than you could ever possibly be. Father Kalini took me and O'Hara aside. Before its transformation, the vampire was a twenty-two-year-old farm laborer with little more than an elementary education. Oh, listen to how it talks. Putting aside the puzzling fact that it speaks English fluently, how could it possibly hold forth like this? I have engaged in many such disquisitions with demons. This is not the symptom of a disease. On the contrary, Don Collini, replied O'Hara, we know that the virus is capable of physically augmenting the biological architecture of its host. You yourself suggested that this includes the brain. Collini nodded. Observe, Father Merchant. He turned to the vampire. Dice in veritatem, spiritus infernalis est. Quid eludes, the vampire replied immediately. Non intelligio, strepitos tuos. Colini turned back to Father O'Hara and me. So the virus is capable of teaching his host to speak Latin? O'Hara scoffed. Is it really so difficult to believe? Just look at everything the creature is capable of. You yourself witnessed it bite through its restraints and leap ten feet in the air. I grow weary of these trifles, the vampire remarked from behind the window. Father O'Hara slammed his fist against one of the buttons on the wall. The vampire unleashed a hideous roar as the window closed. Enough, growled O'Hara. There are two options on the table here, both untested, and the Holy Father has ordered you to consider them, Father Merchant. That is what you must do. But what's the second option? I asked earnestly. The, uh, Ritus Exorcismus, replied Dom Collini, which would, in all likelihood, destroy the subject, retorted O'Hara. We have two dozen such subjects in our custody at present said Collini. If everything you claim about them is accurate, then surely we can afford to sacrifice one or two. Gentlemen, I interjected, I should like to speak with Father Mishleski. 
Unfortunately, he is not with us at the moment, O'Hara replied. He was attacked by a subject last week and is recovering from his injuries at Salvatore Mundi. I'll direct you to his laboratory. We proceeded through a maze-like corridor and entered the room in question, a typical research lab of the sort found in universities and hospitals throughout the world. Father O'Hara picked up a large portfolio from one of the tables and handed it to me. All of Miss Lesky's findings are here, he said. As I hinted at previously, the trial vaccine employs rapidly multiplying stem cells that have been genetically modified to destroy the virus and restore the original cells. Thus far, testing has only been conducted on individual cells. And what were the results? I inquired, skimming through the contents of the portfolio. The vaccine doesn't appear to destroy the virus so much as freeze it. O'Hara replied. In other words, it places the virus itself in suspended animation, thereby liberating the recoded human cells. And, just to be clear, no attempt has been made to exercise the subjects, I asked. Father Collini shook his head. Not yet. After spending several minutes weighing the options in my head, I turned to my colleagues and sighed heavily. I believe... We should test the vaccine on Mr. Grubacic. Not long thereafter, Father Antolini escorted me to my accommodations, where I spent a mostly sleepless night attempting to process the otherworldly ordeal I'd just endured. Early the following day, I returned to the Institute, where Fathers O'Hara and Collini were waiting for me outside what appeared to be an operating theatre. The three of us dressed ourselves in surgical garb and sanitized accordingly, Inside the theatre was the vampire Tomislav, who had been somehow subdued, I dared not ask how, and chained to the operating table. The vampire thrashed about wildly and screamed a seemingly endless litany of curses at us. Father O'Hara produced a small vial from an adjacent refrigeration unit. This is the vaccine, he said through his mask. We'll be injecting ten cc's directly into the subject's abdomen. Proceed, I muttered. O'Hara drew the syringe and turned to the vampire, whose belly, despite all the thrashing, was mostly holding still. Fuck you, priest, the vampire bellowed as O'Hara plunged the needle into its umbilicus and depressed the stopper. The vampire instantly fell silent and became stock still. His face contorted into a look of confusion its eyes rolling around maniacally in its skull. After a minute or so, it fixed its gaze on Father O'Hara and whispered in Serbian, Where am I? What's going on? My colleagues and I looked at one another. A moment later, the creature erupted into a flood of agonized wails and resumed its thrashing with even greater intensity. Before my very eyes, hundreds of cyst-like growths began to appear over the entire length of its pale body. The growths started to swell and redden as they proliferated. In less than thirty seconds, they completely covered the vampire's body, obscuring and distorting his features beyond recognition. Some grew to the size of grapefruits. Well, no sooner had I observed these things when the body in front of me exploded in a torrent of gore the force of which knocked us clean off our feet. Rushing to wipe the blood and any tissue from our surgical visors, I saw that nothing remained of the body save a bubbling pile of bone, sinew, and torn flesh. The entire operating theatre was dripping with carnage, as were our own blood-soaked garments. For a moment everything was still, but the rivulets of gore slithering down the wall. We then heard something like a distant, guttural moan that seemed to emanate from nowhere in particular. I immediately crossed myself, and my colleagues did the same. We exited the theatre in stunned silence, and did our best to unburden ourselves of the creature's remains. Taking several hours to recuperate, we reconvened in our original meeting spot, the library, and stared at each other wordlessly. "'You are the scientists.' Father Collini said, breaking the silence. What happened? I really have no idea, I replied. 
But if I had to guess, we just observed the most violent and aggressive instance of cancer in the history of creation. Father O'Hara said nothing. Turning to him, I noticed he was cradling his face in his hands and trembling slightly. Father, are you all right? I asked. There was no response. Father Collini and I looked at each other nervously. Father O'Hara, Collini said, reaching out to place his hand on O'Hara's shoulder. And in an instant, O'Hara sprang forward from his seat with a piercing scream and grabbed Collini's forearm. I tumbled backwards from my seat. Just as I began to yell, O'Hara effortlessly pulled Collini across the table and flung him like a doll across the length of the room, his body crashing violently into the bookshelves. O'Hara's head turned toward me with a snap. In a matter of seconds, the pupils of his eyes narrowed to cat-like slits, the surrounding sclera turning a sickening shade of yellow, the incisors in his gaping mouth transforming into knife-like fangs. Moments later, the door of the library swung open and a cadre of soldiers in full armor swarmed the room. O'Hara emitted a nauseating hiss before the leader of the cadre fired what appeared to be a dart directly between his sulfurous eyes. Immediately, the priest dropped to the floor, motionless. Several soldiers rushed upon his body and shackled him. The soldier who'd fired the dart crouched down next to me and lifted his visor. Are you okay, father? he asked with concern. His helmet was emblazoned with the insignia of the Pontificia Cohors Helvetica, the Swiss Guard. Oh, see to Dom Collini, I stammered, gesturing weakly toward the other side of the library, and then everything faded to black. I woke some time later in a small infirmary. Father Collini was sitting next to my bed, flanked by several Swiss guards. He was bruised and disheveled, but otherwise no worse for wear. You fainted, Father Merchant, he said calmly. I coughed and pulled myself into a sitting position. <laughs> Are you all right, Father? Uh, fine. And, um, Father O'Hara? Collini sighed. He is uh, infected, uh, transformed. But how? I asked, horrified. He wasn't bitten. Collini shrugged slightly and glanced at the floor. I believe my uh, hypothesis has been vindicated, he said somberly. The virus wasn't communicated to O'Hara by physical means. Whatever dark entity had been dwelling within the vampire was evicted upon the destruction of its body and immediately took up residence in our colleague. It is not the virus that causes the vampire, but the vampire, or rather its spirit, that causes the virus. If that's so... Yes, Collini interrupted. The spirit must be cast out by exorcism. There's only one problem, and I'm afraid it's rather grave. While we were recovering from the episode with Tomislav, it appears that Father O'Hara surreptitiously administered the vaccine to all 24 of the vampires in this facility. Every single one of them has been destroyed. My jaw dropped. Then, then the spirits have been unleashed. No sooner had the words left my mouth than I began to hear a chorus of screams erupting from every corner of the Institute. The Swiss Guard drew their weapons, their heads darting frantically from left to right. Don Collini and I looked at each other. Run, he whispered. And what followed is a blur. Somehow I managed to escape and take shelter in the very hotel where I now write this account. Less than an hour later, I began to hear sirens blazing through the streets of Rome. The news was reporting that a biohazard incident had occurred at Vatican City, which has since gone into a complete lockdown. Regardless of what happens next, it's unlikely that the truth will be forthcoming, in which case I hope this account will find the light of day. As for me, however, I fear that one of the many demonic spirits that were unleashed in the bowels of the Vatican this morning has taken possession of me. I can slowly feel it squeezing my life away. 
The window of my room is open, looming thirty stories above the street. It beckons to me. Oh, I trust that God will forgive me for what I must do. I will not allow this demon to turn me. Part 2 It was a prematurely dark afternoon in Rome. Three hours earlier, the Angelus bells were tolling solemnly over the rooftops. A fog as thick as stone had risen from the Tiber and woven itself like gossamer through the winding arteries of the city, draping it in damp, drizzling shadow. Deep in the noiseless spall of the Apostolic Palace, two priests sat silently in the gloomy antechamber, their eyes fixed on the enormous oaken door that loomed before them. The younger of the two was a Jesuit in his late fifties, a short, perfectly bald man with a spry, stocky build of a prize-fighter beneath his black cassock. The brow over his thin metal spectacles was deeply furrowed, his eyes deep-set and steely. A jagged scar covered the entire length of his face, from temple to chin. The other was a stooped, weather-beaten old man cloaked in the austere robes of a Dominican friar, his sunken cheeks fringed by snow-white whiskers. What remained of his powdery hair curled in ringlets around his black suchetto. After some time, the Jesuit turned to his companion and grinned. So, what are you in for? He inquired in a deep Slavic baritone, his eyes twinkling mischievously. The old friar smirked. I see you haven't lost your sense of humor, Father Mishlevsky. Hmm. One needs a sense of humor in this line of work, Dom Colini, he replied, clapping the friar chummily on his knee. Colini chuckled despite himself. Indeed, and also patience, he remarked, glancing at his wristwatch. You'd think the church would have learned to keep to a schedule after two thousand years. Just then, the door began to open. Oh, speak of the devil, Mishlevsky mused sardonically. A young priest emerged from the shadows beyond the door, his face pale in the half-light. Reverend fathers, he said, extending a thin hand. Please come with me. The two men looked at each other apprehensively and rose from their seats. Following behind the young priest, they entered a cavernous, candle-lit room, its walls cloaked from floor to ceiling with bright medieval tapestries. Sitting behind a long, ornately carved table near the center of the room were three cardinals. The one in the center, a tall, stern-looking African with fiery eyes and a severe jaw, gestured at two adjacent chairs. Fathers, he said in a booming voice that echoed throughout the room. The cardinal to his left was a rotund, cherub-like man with a double chin that jiggled over his pectoral cross. The other was a slender, middle-aged man with hawk-like eyes and thin, tightly pressed lips. The two priests crossed the room, making to kiss the cardinal's rings. The imposing African raised his hand abruptly. No need for the formalities today, he thundered. Please, take a seat. The priests did as he requested, Colini placing his hands in his lap, Mishlevsky folding his muscular arms across his chest. The young priest who escorted them into the room took his place at a nearby desk equipped with what appeared to be a tape recorder. I am Cardinal Boniface Ngoa of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. To my right is Cardinal Picciarelli, who is appearing on behalf of the Signatura. To my left is Cardinal Michele from the Secretariat of State. We have been appointed by His Eminence Cardinal Boccinello to conduct this hearing, which shall be recorded by my assistant, Father Spizzi. Now, revered fathers, please be so kind as to state your names and positions for the record. Colini and Mislevsky glanced at each other nervously. Don't look at me, Miss Lesky muttered. You're the one that got us into this mess. Colini scowled at his companion before turning to the cardinals and clearing his throat noisily. Your eminence, he said. I'm Father Paolo Colini, friar of the Ordo Predictorium and professor of medieval history at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. 
And, replied Cardinal Ngoa forcefully, Kalini sighed, uh, and also Chief Exorcist and Chair of the Department of Demonology in the Pontifical Institute of Occult Studies. And you, Father, said Ngoa, turning to Mishlevsky, the whole truth, if you please. Sebastian Mishlevsky, your eminence, his companion intoned gruffly, Society of Jesus, Professor of Pathology at La Sapienza, Chief Pathologists of the Institute's Biological Division. Thank you, Reverend Fathers, Cardinal Ngoa said, rifling through an enormous portfolio that was laid out on the desk before him. Now, as you are aware, we're here to discuss the incident that took place on September 27th of this year. You should know that we have already interviewed the half-dozen or so other witnesses who managed to survive this incident, as well as other personnel from the Institute who were fortunate enough to be absent when it occurred. We have also conducted an extremely thorough and highly classified investigation into the activities of the Institute, including a painstaking review of your late colleague Father O'Hara's research. Needless to say, all of this has come as a colossal shock to those members of the Curia who have been made privy to our findings. Kalini and Mislevsky glanced at each other again with palpable anxiety. The corpulent Cardinal Michelet chuckled slightly. This is an understatement, he remarked in a simpering voice. We cannot begin to comprehend what a monumental disaster this has been for the Secretariat of State. We are no strangers to scandals and cover-ups, but the lengths we have had to go to clean up this particular mess have been nothing short of Herculean. Oh, I shudder to think how worse the situation would be had Father Merchant's letter ended up in the wrong hands. Fortunately, we've managed to spin the incident as a freak scientific mishap. Oh, for the time being, at least, this spin is being accepted by the public and the wider church. Not to uh, dismiss my colleague's concerns, said Cardinal Picciarelli, but PR is the least of our worries at present. Over and above the sixteen documented fatalities, there are at least a dozen Vatican personnel who remain unaccounted for and are presumed to be at large. This includes Father Merchant, whose whereabouts have been unknown since the gendarmerie discovered his letter at the Hotel Borges. Father Merchant is alive? stammered Don Colini incredulously. We are asking the questions here, Father, bellowed Cardinal Ngoa. You are reputed to have performed more exorcisms than any living man of the cloth. How is it, then, that none of the exorcists known to the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith have ever heard of you in this capacity? As far as we're aware, only a handful of exorcisms have taken place under the Church's imprimatur since the Second Vatican Council. You were not consulted by any of the parties involved in these cases. Is that correct? Yes, Don Collini replied with a sigh. The uh, fellows of the Institute are bound by a strict oath of secrecy that we have scrupulously maintained for eight centuries. Is this true, Father Mislevsky? Ngoa asked. You know it is, Your Eminence, Mislevsky replied tersely. You've already gone through our archives with a finely toothed comb. Ngoa frowned menacingly. Regardless, I want these things stated for the record, he said through gritted teeth. The church's official position was, and is, that vampires do not exist. Yet the Institute has been tussling with them for centuries. Among the volumes we found in your collection is a manuscript from the 12th century entitled De Vampiris et Alias Daemonis Incarnati. Are you familiar with it, Don Collini? Collini shrugged. Of course. It was written by Berengar of Guzon, the principal associate of the Institute's founder, St. Alethius of Chartres. When the text describes vampires as corpses that have been reanimated by infernal powers to wreak havoc on the living, correct? Goa asked. Yes, Collini replied. And does it explain when... Where and how these creatures first came into existence? Kalini nodded. Berengar notes correctly that tales of vampire-like beings have figured in countless folk traditions from time immemorial. 
Nonetheless, he speculates that the first true vampire was a Jewish apostate from the Second Temple period named Simeon ben Simeon. According to several Kabbalistic texts, he was evidently a rabbi who had been anathematized for dabbling in necromancy and other occult practices. Berengar claims that Ben Simeon successfully conjured a demon called Yophiel, to whom he offered his soul in exchange for the eternal youth. The demon proceeded to rest his soul and take possession of his body. What do you mean by rest his soul? Cardinal Picciarelli inquired pointedly. Uh, simply put, it killed the rabbi and forcibly evacuated his spirit, presumably to hell, Galini replied. Mm, so this incarnate demon proceeded to prey upon the living, thereby creating new vampires, Ngoa asked. Father Kalini sighed and shook his head. Uh, we do not know exactly. In addition to infernal pacts, Berengar believed that those who are bitten or otherwise attacked by vampires can become vampires in turn. For the most part, this aligns with our research, as you surely know by now. It's not entirely clear to us, however, why some of the vampires' victims transform and others do not. It has to do with an enzyme that's produced through the fangs, Miss Lesky interjected. Ngoa raised his hand. I will speak to you presently, Father Mishlevsky, he snapped. Kindly wait your turn. Now, Don Kalini. The text claims that vampires can be destroyed by means of fire, sunlight, decapitation, and destruction of the heart. Is this correct? Yes, Kalini replied, although the heart can only be successfully destroyed with a stake constructed of ashwood. Why ashwood? asked Cardinal Michelet, puzzlingly. Kalini shrugged. We don't know. Uh, in the legends, ash is one of many trees from which the true cross is reputed to have been fabricated. This is as good an explanation as any. Vampires are also vulnerable to euphorbium milii, the plant associated with the crown of thorns, as well as silver. The latter weakness has long been associated with Judas Iscariot's betrayal of Christ, although, as Father Mishlevsky can attest, there appears to be biochemical factors involved as well. In any case, Ngoa continued, vampires can be destroyed, and this has been the Church's preferred method for dealing with them for centuries, yes? Kalini nodded. And who exactly was responsible for doing this? Ngoa asked. Uh, in the year 1156, Pope Adrian IV directed St. Aletheus to form a secret army of vampire slayers under the auspices of the Institute. Uh, thus was founded the Ordo Melutum Sacri Cordis, the uh, Order of Knights of the Sacred Heart, a secret cadre of warrior priests. In the 16th century, the order was reconstituted as a secret division of the Pontifical Swiss Guard. Does the order remain active? In 1967, Pope Paul VI directed the Institute to adopt its present policy, Galini replied. Which is uh, what exactly? inquired Cardinal Michelet. Uh, to conduct scientific research on captured vampires, said Galini with a shrug. Members of the Order have been responsible for doing the capturing. They also serve as the Institute's gendarme. Tom Kalini, and Goa intoned gravely, if vampires are demons, then surely the church has seen fit to exorcise them, yes? Kalini averted his gaze. No, he replied sheepishly. Goa's brow furrowed. Why not? Because until recently the prevailing view has been that vampirism is a largely biological phenomenon with a largely biological solution. Mishlevsky interjected. All right, Father Mishlevsky. Ngoa replied with a heaving sigh. Oh, let's talk about that. Your late colleague Father O'Hara was the first to discover that vampirism is caused by a virus or a virus-like pathogen, correct? He did not propose a theory, Mishlevsky said, but he was the first to confirm it experimentally, under laboratory conditions. 
and you yourself have been responsible for developing a medicinal treatment for this illness? Ngoa asked. My team and I, yes, Mishlevsky replied. Ngoa nodded. Oh, by the way, he said with feigned precipitance, how did you come by that terrible scar on your face? Mishlevsky squared his jaw. I was attacked by a subject, he replied. The damn thing tore me to pieces with his claws. And that is why you were not present during the events of September. That's right, Mislevsky said. I was in hospital at the time. Mm, I see, Ngoa said with a nod. At any point previously were any of the uh, subjects in your custody intentionally or unintentionally destroyed? Yes, Mishlevsky replied. During the first ten or so years of the project, several studies were undertaken to confirm traditional claims regarding the vampire's weaknesses, as well as to investigate its hemophagic diet. That was before my and O'Hara's time, however. In the fifteen years that we'd been involved, all subjects were meticulously preserved. Just to be clear, Ngoa continued, your considered judgment prior to the events in question was that vampirism can only be transmitted by physical means, yes? That was my position, yes, Mishlevsky replied. And once a trial vaccine was developed, the Holy Father summoned Father Merchant from Washington for purposes of weighing the merits of testing it. That's right, Mishlevsky said. Had you not been indisposed, interjected Cardinal Michelet, I take it that you would have sided with Father O'Hara and uh, agreed with Father Mershon's verdict. No question, Mishlevsky stated decisively. I had absolutely no reason to anticipate these consequences. To this very day, I still have no idea how to account for them. But you and Father O'Hara both agreed that vampirism is, to some extent at least, an infernal phenomenon, Cardinal Picciarelli added. Why then did you not favor Dom Colini's recommended course of action? Mishlevsky glowered at the Cardinal. Our position was that the N1PH virus causes human beings to transform into demons, not the other way round, in which case exorcism would most likely accomplish nothing but the subject's destruction. A medical intervention, in contrast, stood to eradicate the virus and restore the human host to life. More so you thought, replied Ngoa brusquely. You say you have no idea why the vaccine backfired in such a spectacular manner. Mislevsky looked away and shook his head weakly. Well then, Ngoa huffed. Do you have any idea why multiple individuals, including Father O'Hara and, we presume, Father Merchant, ended up being infected despite the fact that none of them were physically attacked by subjects? Ngoa asked. There's no scientific explanation for it, Mislevsky said in a defeated tone. Ngoa grinned smugly. Hmm, if I may return to you, Dom Colini, he said, is it not your position that the destruction of the subject's physical form is what facilitated the transmission of the virus? Yes, Colini agreed. My theory was, is that N1PH is merely a particular modality of demonic possession. It is the mechanism by which certain species of disembodied spirits prey upon us. When the bodies of the undead are destroyed, this essentially liberates the spirits in question, thereby allowing them to infect others. Ngoa shook his head confusedly. But you yourself said earlier that the church has been hunting and killing vampires for centuries. Were there any known instances of the virus being transmitted in this manner before now? Uh, not as far as I or anyone else knows, Colini replied with a shrug. According to Berenga, the souls of innocent people who have been murdered by vampires go to God, whereas when the vampire is destroyed, the vampiric entity returns to hell, just as other demons do when they are exorcised from the bodies of the living. Hmm, all right, Ngoa said. If I may shift gears for a moment, Dom Colini, can you state in your own words what transpired following the destruction of the vampire known as Tomislav and the subsequent transformation of Father O'Hara? 
Fellini shuddered despite himself. As uh, Father Merchant stated in his testimony, members of the Swiss Guard heard a commotion in the library and, upon entering it, proceeded to subdue Father O'Hara, or rather, what used to be Father O'Hara, according to our standard methods. They then tended to my injuries and took Father Merchant, who had fainted, to the infirmary. Not long thereafter, we discovered that O'Hara had administered the vaccine to all of the 24 subjects in custody, all of whom met the same fate as Tomislav. I informed Father Merchant of this once he had regained consciousness. And it was at this point you began to hear screams throughout the facility, yes? Yes, Colini said in a faltering voice. Father Merchant fled at my urging. I then rushed out to the hallway alongside the team of guards, where we immediately beheld several other guards firing their weapons at Institute personnel who had evidently become vampires. Who gave you the command to employ incendiary weapons against the creatures? Cardinal Michelet inquired. Uh, Captain Ossing, on my recommendation, Colini replied. And why did you make such a recommendation at that particular juncture? Colini studied his shoes pensively. I don't quite know. Many scholars in the tradition have argued that fire is the most potent and decisive weapon in the Slayer's arsenal. Perhaps I was thinking this in the back of my mind. And was this course of action successful? Cardinal Picciarelli asked. Uh, we successfully neutralized eight vampires, as you know, Colini replied. Well, at least a dozen appeared to have escaped, including the former Father O'Hara, whom Goa counted. Is it not so? Kalini fixed a steely-eyed gaze at Ngoa. It is, he replied quietly. But... But what? Ngoa growled. No further infections have occurred in Vatican City since that day, Your Eminence. Ngoa pursed his lips and nodded. And you think the flamethrowers are responsible for this? Your guess is as good as mine, Reverend Cardinal, Colini replied with a shrug. Ngoa sunk into his chair and stared up at the towering ceiling. Here's where we are now, he said. All, or virtually all, of the facts on the ground, including the existence of the Institute itself, have been suppressed, at least for the time being. Obviously, many more are privy to them now than were before, but, but only within the steepest reaches of the hierarchy. The Holy Father will review the findings of this hearing alongside all the others and arrive at a determination regarding our next step. I must tell you, though, that he already has certain predilections. He intends to shutter the Institute. Mishleski volunteered. Ngoa shook his head. On the contrary, he replied, the Holy Father believes that this incident may bespeak a novel and wholly unprecedented diabolical threat. For this reason, he favors the re-establishment of the Order of the Knights of Sacred Heart and the immediate resumption of full-time vampire hunting. If this is what he ultimately directs us to do, it will fall upon you and other senior members of the Institute, as well as your compatriots in the Swiss Guard, to see that his wishes are fulfilled. Your first priority will be locating the missing, particularly Father Merchant. Kalini and Mishlevsky turned toward each other with wide eyes and mouths ajar. That is all, fathers, Ngoa pronounced gravely. Vare cum Dio. Father Simon Merchant stepped out onto the small balcony of his room at the Hotel Borges which loomed some thirty stories above the bustling Via Crescenzio below. Trembling and drenched in sweat, the priest closed his eyes, crossed himself, and plunged headlong into the brisk night air. In an instant, everything went black. Much to his startled chagrin, Father Merchant realized that he was still conscious. I'm dead, he thought to himself in the void of his mind. That remains to be seen, replied an ethereal voice almost immediately. With growing awareness of the feeling of his body, Father Merchant slowly opened his eyes to a brilliant night sky. 
A chilly breeze swept over his supine form, rippling his cassock. From somewhere far below, he could hear the sound of traffic. Pulling himself erect, the priest surveyed his surroundings with awe-struck eyes. He was on the roof of St. Peter's Basilica. I hope you're not afraid of heights, the ghostly voice said behind him. Turning his head with a snap, Father Merchant saw a beautiful, statuesque woman in a billowing snow-white trench coat. Her blonde hair whipped wildly around her porcelain face. Who? What? Merchant stammered weakly. The woman crouched down and fixed her piercing blue eyes on him, the size of her mouth curling into a radiant smile. She placed her hand on his trembling shoulder and, all at once, he felt nothing but warmth and calm. I am Shimushel, she said, her voice now clear and distinct. Are you uh, an angel? <laughs> she laughed, giving Merchant a wink. I suppose that is what you call us. Now be still and listen. The evil that has befallen you is lifted. She gestured to her left, where Merchant spied a vaporous, coal black cloud hovering in midair above the precipice. Merchant's jaw dropped. This is the shed, the demon as you call it, that dwelled within you, seeking your destruction. Had you gone through with your plan, it would have exited your lifeless body and immediately taken possession of the nearest passerby. My master has seen fit to prevent this from happening. You mean, God? Merchant said in a near whisper. Shimashel nodded. But why? Because your work is not yet finished, she replied. My master gives you this choice. Obey his will and live, or deny him and die. W why me? What does he want from me? Merchant sputtered. The angel glanced at the cloud-like spectre. The enemy is abroad, yet something has changed. What you have witnessed is uh, new, she said. You are among those who have been chosen to wage war against it. I don't understand, Merchant replied, utterly beside himself. It was no mistake that the church summoned you, the angel continued. You will understand why in time, but now you must make your choice. A covenant has been offered. Should you enter it, the wage is life and the cost is service. My master, for his part, will always be at your side in this. If you decline, the wage is death, but you shall not suffer, not suffer the torments of hell, only the eternal pangs of your own conscience. The master has said, no greater love is there than to lay down one's life for a friend. You are his friend if you keep his commands. Tell me what I must do, merchant beseeched. You must go from this place and abide for forty days during which time you will receive further counsel. You shall not speak to any mortal soul. You shall speak only to God and his messengers. Do you accept? Father Merchant stared into the angel's face through tear-filled eyes. With slow deliberation, he crossed himself and exhaled deeply. All around him, the night sparkled and shone. I am the servant of the Lord, he whispered. Be it done to me according to his will. Following Kalini's and Mishlevsky's inquest, a terrific storm erupted in the skies of Rome. Rain fell in buckets upon the streets as scores of pedestrians rushed to take shelter or to return to their homes. Among them was a young Carmelite nun named Sister Immaculata, who was en route to her chapter house when the storm descended. Pulling her black mantle over her habit, she ducked quickly into an alley where she found refuge from the downpour in a damp alcove. In the momentary flash of lightning, she saw what appeared to be a priest standing on the other side of the alley. Father, she shouted over the din of the storm. Motionless and obscure by shadow, the priest said nothing. A moment later he began to pace slowly toward her across the flooding cobblestones. The priest stopped standing close enough to the nun that she could hear his raspy breathing, but far enough away that his face remained concealed. 
When the lightning flashed again, Sister Immaculata's eyes widened and her mouth fell open into a silent scream. The glowing yellow eyes and gleaming razor-like fangs that appeared before her were the last things she would ever see with human eyes. All across the Eternal City that night, the sewers would run red with innocent blood. Part 3 Texts and Visions From the Times of London, 3rd of February Rome. Six additional victims have been identified in the latest of a string of disappearances and brutal homicides that have been terrorizing the Italian capital for nearly five weeks. According to a joint statement from the municipal police, the Polizia di Stato, and the Carabinieri, law enforcement officials are redoubling their efforts to investigate the crimes, which have thus far resulted in at least 16 disappearances and 27 confirmed slayings. The body of the first known victim, a 30-year-old nun named Sister Immaculata Bruno was discovered in early January. As of this morning, there are no firm leads. On a cold but otherwise calm February evening, a pair of carabinieri were just about to complete their shift when they received a call from dispatch reporting a disturbance and possible break-in at the Church of St. Hilary in the Trastevere district. Officer Angioni, the senior of the two, rolled his eyes and heaved an annoyed sigh. Ah, the hell with this, he said to his partner, Fiorelli. I just want to grab a sandwich and go home to bed already. Yeah, it's probably just some crazy bum, drunk off his ass, Fiorelli replied. Let's get it over with. Arriving at the church a few minutes later, the officers encountered a nervous-looking priest pacing outside the door of the rectory. Upon seeing them, he rushed forward. Officers! he sputtered, pointing to the adjacent church. There's someone in there. Okay, just calm down, father, replied Angioni, placing his hands on the priest's shoulders. Are you the one who phoned this in? Yes, the priest replied with unabated agitation. I am the pastor here. I was awakened by loud sounds in the church, banging sounds, crashing, glass breaking. Please help. Okay, okay said Angioni calmly. Just go back inside and we'll check it out. After following up with dispatch, the two carabinieri gingerly entered the church. Police, they bellowed in unison, drawing their sleek black berettas and surveying the darkened sanctuary with their torches. Almost immediately, the narrow beams of light revealed a shadowy figure crouched down near the altar. Though its back was turned to them, they could see it was clothed in the garb of a nun. Identify yourself, Angioni yelled, stepping slowly down the center aisle. The two officers noticed that the church was an utter shambles, the marble floor littered with shards of glass and porcelain. The figure stood motionless and said nothing. Halting a few paces from it, Angioni and Fiorelli repeated their command with greater force. With blinding suddenness, the figure wheeled around and jumped to its feet. The inhuman face that appeared in the light of the torches was smeared with blood, its yellow eyes blazing, its fanged maw dripping with gore. To their utter horror, the officers saw it was clutching the mutilated body of an infant in its claw-like hands, the tiny head of which had been nearly ripped from its shoulders. A sudden motion of the thing before them issued a sickening spray of blood, just as it began to emit a piercing shriek The two carabinieri frantically unloaded their pistols, the church erupting in a thunderous cacophony of bullets. The impact of the shots pummeled the creature, launching its body backwards into the altarpiece. The mangled corpse from its hands took flight and crashed a hideous splat somewhere in the shadows. What the fuck? What the fuck? Fiorelli stammered, his pistol trembling violently. Only slightly less rattled, Angioni took a few cautious steps toward the creature, which lay crumpled and motionless in a heap below the altar. Just as he reached down, his eyes shot open and, with a monstrous hiss, it grabbed his collar and pulled him downward with one hand. With otherworldly speed, the other hand tore into Angioni's throat just below the chin. 
the talons of its fingers emerging seconds later from between his lips and curling into a grip. All at once the hand jerked backwards, wrenching the policeman's lower jaw clean from his skull with a sound like ripping paper. A grisly torrent of blood erupted from the void as his body slumped lifelessly to the ground. Fiorelli's eyes had barely had a chance to widen when the creature fell upon him nose to nose, his torch and sidearm clattering against the floor. Locking its gnarled fingers around his waist, the thing catapulted him straight up into the ceiling of the church, his head exploding like a melon against the stone buttresses. Moments later, the body returned to earth with a wet thud, its ruined skull showering nearby pews with brain and bone. In the candle smoke gloom of the sanctuary, the creature snickered fiendishly, its formerly white habit stained with the darkest of reds. Dona Norbis Passem, it croaked through bloody lips. From the Washington Post, 3rd of January. Rome. Vatican City officials report that Father Simon Merchant a well-known virologist and erstwhile professor at Georgetown University remains missing following a biohazard incident that took place at a Vatican laboratory in September. According to spokespersons for Georgetown and the Archdiocese of Washington, Merchant was visiting Rome on unspecified business at the time of the incident, having been summoned by the Secretary General of his religious order, the Society of Jesus, in late August. Although specific details of the nature and cause of the incident are scarce, the Vatican has confirmed at least eight fatalities, including the renowned microbiologist Gerard O'Hara, late of Trinity University in Dublin, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology two years previously. Olivia Norcross had been waiting outside the Department of Microbiology for nearly 45 minutes when an administrative assistant finally ushered her into the interim chair's office. She was a prim, unassuming woman of 27, with sable hair and olive complexion. Unconventionally attractive, even beautiful, despite the heavy toll taken by overwork and chronic lack of sleep. A brilliant graduate student of considerable promise. She had, until recently, been Simon Merchant's protégé and star pupil, overseeing nearly a dozen clinical studies and clocking in countless hours in Merchant's lab. In the wake of his mysterious disappearance, she felt herself rudderless and adrift, inching closer and closer to a thorough unravelling. Merchant wasn't simply her mentor and role model, he was practically a surrogate father. Though she was an unrelenting atheist who could not reconcile Merchant's scientific genius with his penchant for superstition, her respect, indeed her fondness for the priest, was limitless and unqualified. Merely thinking of his messy mop of salt and pepper hair and kind brown eyes almost brought her to tears. She was worried sick about him. The chair, a short, disheveled man with a blousy comb over, met her at the door and invited her to take a seat. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Miss Norcross, he said with a note of exhaustion, plopping down behind his desk. What can I do for you? Olivia placed her weather-beaten bag on the floor next to her, straightened her posture, and folded her hands politely in her lap. Thanks for making time for me, Dr. Davis, she replied. I know how busy you are. Davis dismissed this remark with a blasé wave of his hand. I just wanted to touch base with you about Simon and Father Merchant, Olivia continued. It's been months now and we, well, you know, me and the other lab rats are still totally in the dark. On top of that, no one's really been providing us with any direction, so we're just kind of flailing about at the moment. I don't know, just, well, I was hoping you could provide some kind of clarification. Davis stared at her with a bored, unblinking gaze. Well, he said, I mean, I don't know what to tell you exactly. I've stepped in as chair, Dr. Gibbons has taken over in McClellan. Classes have been reassigned. Sorry, she interrupted, but... It's not ex She closed her eyes and heaved a frustrated sigh. Look, who is bottom lining this situation exactly? The Jesuits? The Vatican? The Italian police? Interpol? Who? 
Davis contorted his lips into an exaggerated frown and shrugged slightly. Well, he replied, my understanding is that the society and the archdiocese are liaising with the Vatican. Okay, Olivia huffed, but what are they saying? The chair remained lackadaisical. That they've been working with the Italian police to locate Father Merchant. Well, thus far unsuccessfully. And are there any leads? Olivia replied with palpable desperation. Not that I know of, said Davis, shrugging disinterestedly. Oh, Jesus Christ, Olivia spat, slapping her hands noisily against the arms of the chair. I mean, are they even trying that hard? One of the world's top microbiologists just, well, vanished into thin air. Does anyone even care? Davis screwed his eyes shut and rubbed his temples. Look, he said with a sigh, I understand your concern, I really do. Believe me, everyone around here feels the same way. But we're taking it very seriously. <laughs> Could have fooled me, Olivia sneered under her breath. But there really isn't anything else we can do, he continued. It's out of our hands. Olivia shook her head in obvious frustration. Right, okay replied brusquely. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for wasting my time, asshole, Olivia thought to herself as she left the office. You know what? Screw this. I'm going to Rome. Simon Merchant awoke in the one-room cottage whence he had suddenly and inexplicably appeared fourteen days earlier. Built of stone and thatch, it was outfitted with little more than a table and chair, a simple straw bed, and a wood-burning stove. There was no electricity. Water had to be drawn from a well, and whenever nature called, the priest was compelled to answer in the ramshackle commode just outside the door. The cottage was set in the centre of a bleak, treeless plain that sprawled for untold miles in every direction before disappearing into the faraway mountains on the horizon. Such as they were, the surrounding flora and fauna hinted vaguely at Italy or Spain, though it could just as well have been New Mexico for all that Mersion was able to determine. Despite the total absence of civilization, to say nothing of human beings, fresh supplies of food, fuel and clothing inexplicably appeared on his doorstep every morning. He'd already tried several times to remain awake long enough to greet his nocturnal visitors, but on every occasion, as if by some enchantment, he'd always ended up succumbing to sleep. Attempts at exploration were equally futile, given the sheer expanse of the plain and the steepness of the distant mountains that ringed it like a castle wall. Apart from the miraculous provisions, Merchant had received no signs from God, nor any other being for that matter, save for the episodic sound of an ethereal voice that whispered, Watch and pray. By this point, Merchant had settled on the notion that every waking moment of the last five months of his life up to and including the present one, was nothing but an elaborate delusion. In other words, that he had completely and utterly lost his mind. As he'd done for the past several mornings, he silently assured himself that none of this was real, that it was all in his head, and that the actual merchant was almost certainly thrashing about in a cushioned room somewhere in Washington. Sane or insane, however, what troubled the priest the most was the thought of friends and loved ones, chief among them his assistant, Olivia, and his aged, ailing father, the only family he had left in the world. Just knowing how much they must be suffering in the wake of his disappearance shrouded his soul with a cloud of guilt. As he lay staring at the thatch-strewn ceiling above, Merchant's mind drifted towards the memory of a conversation he'd had with Olivia, one of the last before his ill-fated journey to Rome. As they were finishing up in the lab one afternoon, He'd noticed her staring at him with an intense, searching look. What's up? he inquired with an amused smile. Olivia looked away, her brow furrowing. Can I, um, ask you something? she replied. Shoot, he said, folding his arms. Do you really believe all that religious bullshit? she asked pointedly after a beat. Merchant's eyebrows raised with surprise. Well, he knew that Olivia was a skeptic, an atheist even, but she had never once broached the topic of religion in their nearly four years of collaboration, and he, for his part, had followed suit. Wow, he replied in a flummoxed tone. 
Didn't see that coming on this particular afternoon. She returned her gaze to him. I'm sorry, she said earnestly. I just... I don't get it. I came to Georgetown to work with you, specifically you, because you're the most brilliant microbiologist on the entire freaking planet. <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere, Miss Norcross, Merchant interjected with a dismissive chuckle. I'm being serious here, Simon, she continued with heightened insistence. How can someone as smart as you possibly go in for all that garbage? I mean, why in the hell are you even a priest? Merchant heaved a sigh, his eyes darkening. Uh, it's complicated, he said with a hint of frustration, pulling himself off the bench he'd been sitting on. But it's later. I don't know if I have the stomach for this right now. I'm sorry, Olivia replied. I didn't mean it. Merchant silenced her with a wave. It's okay, he intoned calmly. Really, you're totally within your rights to ask. I mean, if the tables were turned, I'd be wondering about it too. I just, well, now's not a good time. Okay, she muttered weakly, a slight blush betraying embarrassment. Merchant smiled knowingly. Look, he said, we've been working together for a long time. I don't have any problem admitting to you that it's an issue for me, my faith, I mean, my vocation as a priest. It has been for a long time. I'm not sure what I believe anymore, and it's very, very difficult, and I'm trying to figure it all out, but... You have to understand that this is very personal, and it's not something I'm ready to discuss with you or, well, frankly, anyone. Olivia stared at him with pitying eyes. Can I just ask, does anyone else know about this? Olivia replied. This is the first time I've said it aloud outside a confessional, Merchant said. Come on, let's get out of here. Returning to his present reality, Merchant felt tears lightly welling. This is why I've lost my mind, he thought to himself. The struggle between faith and doubt has literally torn it apart. And all at once, a new and different voice intruded his sad reverie. Are you so bored that you're telling yourself stories to pass time? The voice mused from somewhere at once both near and far. It was male with the slightest hint of an accent. No longer phased by such occurrences, Merchant groaned and pulled a pillow over his face. This is not real, he insisted to himself. Just then, the door of the cottage swung open, flooding the room with milky morning light. Pushing the pillow away just enough to peek through one eye, Merchant spied a tall figure stepping across the threshold. His appearance sent startled jolts down Merchant's spine. It can't be, the priest gasped inside his head. The figure before him was a roguishly handsome man in his early forties, a halo of dark hair ringing his otherwise bald pate, his sharp features set in relief against a short, well-trimmed beard. He wore the cassock of a Jesuit, or be one whose cut and shape belonged to the sixteenth century. Merchant's recognition was instantaneous. My God, he said in whispered, complete amazement, you're Ignatius Loyola. The man kicked the dust from his shoes and took a few more steps into the room. His mouth curled into a grin, his dark eyes twinkling. Hello, my name is Inigo Loyola. Prepare to pray, he said, eyeing Merchant expectantly. When the latter failed to respond, the man frowned. Oh, come on, he said with faux exasperation. Haven't you ever seen the Princess Bride? The big guy upstairs is a huge fan. He never gets tired of that guy. Merchant blinked, his mouth agape. Oh, tough crowd, the man said with a mirthful laugh, producing what appeared to be a cigar from the folds of his cassock. Is this thing on? Who the hell? Merchant stammered. The man placed the cigar between his lips, and with a snap of his fingers, it magically ignited. They were going to send Alethius, but I protested, he said, taking a deep drag. Never send a Carthusian to do a Jesuit's work, especially when there are Jesuit asses on the line. He exhaled a billowing cloud of redolent smoke. And if it's a Jesuit you're going to send, well, you could do certainly worse than the founder of the order, right? It's official, 
Merchant said to himself. I am completely, totally and certifiably insane. The man chuckled. Oh, come on now, he said with a playful click of his tongue. Quit feeling sorry for yourself and get the hell out of that bed. It's a beautiful day and you must join me for a walk. From Berengar of Guisons, De Vampiris et Taleis Demonis Incarnati On Vampires and Other Embodied Demons Translated from the Latin by Father Paolo Collini, O.P. Let him who is wise guard himself against the vampire's cunning. Like all who dwell in the abode of the adversary, it is a deceiver without peer. Exploiting mortal weakness, it will stop at nothing to confound the children of God and lay waste to their souls. Though it expertly mimics the speech, action, and even character of its victim, do not be fooled by this canard. The victim's soul has long since fled its body. Only the demon remains. It is said that the progenitor of all vampires was the sorcerer Ben Simeon, the defiler of the covenant, the corrupter of the law, the satanic invert of Moses and all of the patriarchs of Israel. From fear of death, he abandoned the god who had freed his people from bondage and elevated them above all nations. Instead, he placed his trust in Yophiel, the demon of vanity, who claimed dominion over his body and consigned his soul to the eternal fire. To this day, the vampire walks the earth, forever slaking its insatiable lust for blood. Sebastian Mishlevsky hammered his fist against the door impatiently, sending a thunderous echo through the gloomy halls of the Dominican Priory of Santa Sabina. Father Collini, he bellowed, are you in there? From behind the door, Mishlevsky could hear a television blaring loudly. Oh, an announcer proclaimed followed by the sound of a roaring crowd. Damn it all, growled someone within. The television went silent, replaced by scraping footfalls, and a moment later, the door opened. Ah, they completely blew it, Father Collini spat, his neck draped in the blue and white scarf of the Lazio football club. I, and against a Roman, no less, gave up three goals, those bombs. I assume you're referring to some kind of athletic competition. Mishlevsky replied sardonically, My condolences. I know how emotional you plebeians tend to get over such things. Colini frowned and shook his head. Chur, he muttered, stepping aside. Mishlevsky folded his hands behind his back and entered the tiny, dust-covered cell, its floors and furniture littered with books. Colini removed his scarf and tossed it onto the bed with a mournful sigh. The Holy Father has arrived at a decision, I presume, he said. Mishlevsky nodded, taking a seat on one of the few amenable chairs. You and I, as well as Ortega and Goyen, have been summoned to meet with the Cardinal Secretary of State this afternoon. Goyen, Kalini said, his eyebrows raised. But he left the priesthood, remember, in response to the abuse scandals. Yes, Mishlevsky replied, which is probably what we should have done as well. Slumping down on his bed, Collini heaved another sombre sigh. Yes, well, he muttered, followed by a long pause. What do you expect his eminence will say? Based on Cardinal and Goa's speculations, Mishlevsky replied, I assume we're being recruited to kill vampires. Collini studied the floor pensively. In that case, he said, it's high time that you knew the truth. We must speak with Ortega and Goyen post-haste. The truth about what? Miss Lesky asked, puzzlingly. About the uh, first vampire, Golini replied. On the table to your right is a facsimile of a 13th century Sephardic text entitled Atruhat e Analysir, a treaty on sorcery, written by Rabbi Ibrahim ben Suleiman. It has been in my possession for years, yet as far as I know, no one in the Christian world is aware of its existence. Mishlevsky glanced at the ancient tome, his brow furrowing. Well, what does it say? he asked. Simply put, Galini replied, the story of Simeon Ben Simeon is a complete fabrication invented by the medieval church to conceal an abhorrent truth. You see, Father Mishlevsky, the first vampire was not a Jew at all, but a Catholic priest. 
Imagine that, Mishlesky said with a sarcastic chuckle. The church blaming the Jews for something that isn't their fault. Surely you jest. Colini frowned. Yeah, I know, I know. Shameful and all too predictable, but here's the rub. The vampire in question continues to walk among us, and it is that vampire that is to blame for our current predicament. Oh, said Mishlesky. And how do you know that? Colini smiled a sad, weak smile. Because it visited me last night. Without seeing any visions, he came to know many spiritual things. St. Ignatius Loyola, writing of himself. Out in the sunlight, Merchant could see that the man before him appeared as real as anything he had ever experienced before or since. As if reading his mind... The latter reached out and grabbed Merchant's chin, giving it a gentle shake. Startled, Merchant recoiled with a slight yelp, much to his companion's amusement. "'You are not the first of our order to lose his faith,' the man said. "'Far from it. Jesuits are always teetering on the precipice between belief and doubt. It's our way.' "'I, I haven't lost my faith,' Merchant sputtered. "'I just can't believe... In what? the man interrupted. Angels, demons, saints, miracles. What's left for you to have faith in when you doubt all these things? Merchant swallowed. God, he replied after a pause. The man nodded. Ah, oh, I see, he said with a smirk. And what kind of God is worth believing in if all these incredible things are somehow beyond his reach? You disappoint me, Padre. Are you sure you're a Jesuit? Merchant stared at the ground and said nothing. Come, the man said, clapping Merchant on the shoulder. Walk with me. The two strolled silently through the tall grass of the plain. You're a learned man, the man remarked. Tell me, what causes you to doubt your own mind? Merchant thought for a moment. None of this is scientifically possible, he replied at length. Does that mean that it's a delusion? Well, no, not necessarily, but as a scientist, I'm obliged to give my assent to the simplest explanation. It's infinitely more likely that I'm mad than that vampires exist or I am being visited by angels and saints. You can't deny this, no matter who or what you are. The man grinned deviously. Let's assume for the sake of argument that I am real he said. How do you know that I'm a messenger of God rather than a demonic trickster? Well, come to that, how do you know that the being who brought you to this place is truly an angel? Perhaps it's Satan himself. I don't know, Merchant replied plainly. That's the point. And yet you claim to know that God exists? I never said that, Merchant retorted with growing exasperation. I don't know that God exists. I... Have faith that he does, <laughs> the man interrupted, even though this cannot be ascertained by scientific means. As the church teaches, Merchant replied, the truth of God is revealed through the light of reason. There is evidence that he exists, whether or not it's scientific in nature. While well, the man scoffed, if you are indeed a madman who cannot trust his own mind, and you do not have any capacity for reason, and so cannot reliably distinguish evidence from mere fancy. And even if you could, what room is left for faith in God if reason suffices to establish his existence? Ask yourself, prior to your recent adventures, had you ever experienced anything in your whole life that so much as hinted at the existence of God under any description? Did you ever experience anything but the terrible absence, the void where God should be but isn't? You must admit that when existence is pondered through the lens of reason alone, the only rational conclusion to draw is that there is no God. Never has been, never will be. Any human being who's endured suffering, whether his own or that of others, immediately understands why this is the case. Reason, science, these things tell us that the universe is at best indifferent and devoid of meaning, at worst the very definition of hell. Merchant cast a sharp glance at his interlocutor. You claim to be St. Ignatius Loyola, he said. 
that's so, then you know none of this is true. The man smiled kindly. I do now, he replied, but I didn't always. When I was in your shoes, I just had faith. Nothing more, nothing less. But why would any rational person have faith when every single thing he encounters in life undermines and belies it? Merchant asked plaintively. Ah, because even the most rational person in the world is still a person, the man replied, which is to say he's more than just a thinker. He's a creature that feels and wills. How ought a person to feel in response to the seeming cruelty and absurdity and meaninglessness of the world he inhabits? Well, he ought to feel abject despair. And what is abject despair but the sad awareness that death is preferable to living in such a world? And what does this awareness yield, save an invitation to exercise the will, to choose? Choose what? asked Merchant meekly. To live honestly and suffer, or to die, the man replied decisively. Most of us refuse to make this choice, or rather, we choose to live dishonestly. We come for themselves with fanciful stories to tell ourselves that reason illuminates the truth of God. We deceive ourselves. Faith is a choice, an act of will. There is no evidence that something is true. Indeed, when all of the available evidence proclaims it false, reason obliges us to doubt. Faith, in contrast, is a matter of willing ourselves to believe without grounds, precisely because there are no grounds. The man produced a small flask from his cassock and took a copious drink before handing it to his stunned, silent companion. You look like you need this. St. Ignatius said with a devilish wink. While we're at it, how about a cigar? From De Deo Lucis et Deo Tenebre, the God of Light and the God of Darkness, an anonymous 4th century text translated from the Latin by Father Paolo Colini, O.P. There is not one God but two, co-eternal and equal in power and wisdom, the one is called darkness, discord, and death. The other, light, love, and life. Their struggle is without beginning or end. From it all things come. What the latter creates, the former destroys. What the former obscures, the latter illuminates. It is the god of light that makes the spirit. It is the god of darkness that traps the spirit in flesh. Evil is the flesh. Goodness is the spirit. On returning to his lonely cell after evening prayers, Dom Collini sat at his desk and studiously revisited an email he'd received earlier that day from a young woman, purportedly a student and close friend of his missing colleague, Father Merchant. I'm coming to Rome to find him, and I need your help, the email read. I know you know the truth, they won't tell me. Just as he was making to reply, Collini was startled by a loud noise. Looking up, he saw the window of his cell had flown open, ushering in a gust of icy wind. His laptop screen and desk lamp flickered erratically. All at once he spied a tall silhouette standing in the moonlight, its hulking form draped in the darkest of shadow. Ave, Patrem, the figure uttered in Latin, its voice a menacing, otherworldly croak. Collini reflexively grabbed the crucifix from his desk. Before he had a chance to speak, the figure had waved its hand half-heartedly, wrenching the holy object from Collini's hand by an unseen force. It hovered in the air for a moment before crashing violently to the floor. Rising slowly from his chair, Collini steeled himself. Quises, intrusus, he shouted forcefully. The figure guffawed maliciously before taking a step forward into the half-light. What appeared before Collini was a towering creature, no less than seven feet tall, clothed from head to toe in the black vestments of an ancient probista, its hairless, bone-white head flanked on both sides by pointed, bat-like ears. Sulphur-coloured eyes glowed like coals over the leering trap of its dagger-filled mouth. The fingers of its pallid hands were inhumanly long and tipped with razors. A fellow priest, the figure replied lugubriously. I'm here to make my confession. I'm guessing this story doesn't end with you chopping off its head or toasting it with a flamethrower, 
Mislevsky mused. Kalini smiled weakly. Sadly, no, he replied. I am actually quite fortunate to be alive, given who I was contending with. The granddaddy of all vampires, Mislevsky remarked dryly. The very same, Kalini said. The incarnate form of the demon your fear. What the Atrahat says is true. In life he was a priest, Roman, late third century. Before the Council of Nicaea, Mishlevsky offered. Yes, Kalini replied with a nod. The text speculates that he was an apostate or heretic of some kind. You're awfully nonchalant about this, Kalini, Mishlevsky said with a smirk. Do you always unwind with a little football after facing down demonic threats? Kalini gave his companion a puzzled look. Of course, he said. What's your point? Mishlevsky chuckled and shook his head. <laughs> Never mind, he said. So, uh, was your demonic friend kind enough to confirm any of these speculations, or what? That would have simplified things immensely, Kalini replied. Unfortunately, the creature wasn't exactly in the mood for conversation. So what did it say then? Mishlevsky inquired searchingly. It said, and I quote, We have come to liberate hell, to wipe your false creed from the face of the earth. We have come to unthrone him, and all with your help. Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? Mishlevsky sniggered cynically. It most certainly does not, Kalini replied sternly. When the demon said your help, I believe that it may have been referring to the church. Mishlevsky's eyes widened. You think the church is in league with these things? Uh, no, not exactly, Kalini replied. I think they may have uh, friends on the inside. Mishlevsky heaved a world-weary sigh. Well, in that case, I guess we'd better find Ortega and Ungoyen. Great minds think alike, Frau, Kalini replied, with a wink. So as I mentioned in the first part of this particular story, it's not officially part of the Vatican Archive canon. <laughs> this is written by a different author, but as incredibly talented as the author of the Vatican Archive story. So um, I hope you're enjoying that. Now you, these are all working pretty much as standalone stories, but I've created a playlist and I've put them in an order that I think makes the most sense. Okay, there's kind of a, an ongoing story behind the stories as well, in which um. The uh, protagonist explains what's going on to him, as well as what he's finding in the archives. Very, very interesting concept, and um, one you seem to be enjoying. But as I said, this is not an official part of the story, but it was inspired by it, so what the hell? Really good anyway. So um, that seems set up for even more. You know, I'm going back into the habit of putting all parts of um, disjointed stories together in one video. And even though these do work as separate, I think this one in particular will benefit from you getting the whole story in one go, like I did today. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Anyway, that's enough for me for one evening. Back again very soon, and of course, I'm over on my second channel, and exclusive content on Patreon, if you feel like bunging me a couple of dollars. It would be very much appreciated. Well, till next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye.